Hey everybody, it's writer and director Len Kabasinski of Killer Wolf Films and welcoming you to a brand new Forgotten Movie Den episode. For those that are new to my newer uh, YouTube channel, because my old one got cancelled. Uh, but, it, but it's there, I'll put up a link for that here. So anyways, go follow that or do what you do on YouTube to, to check out my videos here and support the show. But the best way to support the program, my films, past, present, future, uh, obviously Patreon. Patreon.com slash Killer Wolf Films. Go there. It's only two bucks to sign up. Um, all my stuff is on there. It really is the best way to support my works. So uh, go check it out. Speaking of uh, my works, some people that follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash Killer Wolf Films. Uh, some people that follow me on there have seen, or fa the Facebook, right, uh, that I'm doing a professional wrestler slasher film. Um, yes, the, the, that is in the works. If all things go right, uh, that would probably start filming in the summertime coming up here. Um, it is called Fear the Crimson Mask. Uh, it is a, a professional wrestling uh, world, uh, set in the world of professional wrestling, and it is like a slasher picture. So, so yeah, that's getting going. We basically have, I'd say, 80% of like an outline uh, done front to finish already, so just filling in a couple points there. I am not writing the script uh, for this one, uh, but I am uh, kind of interjecting uh, certain things uh, uh, that I need uh, to, to make the film successful, in my opinion. So, uh, so yeah, you know, X amount of TNA scenes, X amount of fight scenes, X amount of professional wrestling type scenes, X, you, know, you get what I'm saying. So that, that's the kind of stuff that I interject in, into the writer's uh, head there, I guess, you know, throwing that out there. But, uh, but yeah, Fear the Crimson Mask, uh, it's got a promo poster. Um, it is uh, John Michael Thor uh, from Rock and Roll Nightmare, who was in my film Pact of Vengeance. Um, with Leo Fong there. Uh, yeah, uh, John Micklethor has expressed some interest in it, so I think we can uh, work around his upcoming tour, which is really exciting, right? Uh, I believe uh, he's playing uh, what uh, the Whiskey or whatever it is uh, in Hollywood there, so uh, I might just have to make a special vacation trip to see that show, right? To see Thor uh, in Hollywood, that'd be, uh, that'd be amazing. But uh, Anyways, John Micklethor has expressed some interest in it. Of course, I've reached out to uh, Diamante uh, from AEW Wrestling and Ring of Honor Wrestling. Uh, you know, again, I had worked with her in uh, Pact of Vengeance as well, so I am sure I will put uh, a message out to Peter Avalon and then maybe see, you know, who else uh, uh, could be interested in this kind of, uh, uh, in this kind of film. But uh, I think it could be a good time. Uh, I'll sure to uh, keep it exciting, keep it something, it's something cool. I'm a slasher fan. I like the slasher films of the 80s kind of thing. So uh, you can kind of expect that kind of thing from me uh, out of this film. So, uh, But more on that uh, as it develops. But really, you want to support that film before I launch an Indiegogo or anything like that, patreon.com slash killerwolffilms. So uh, I hope you check it out. Tonight on The Forgotten Movie 10, we, we have... Really, uh, this would have been a title that would have been... I, I would have jumped on this uh, right off the bat in a, in a mom-and-pop video store around here in Erie, Pennsylvania. You know, not the blockbusters of the world because they wouldn't have had a title like this that we're going to talk about. But it definitely would have been uh, one of those obscure titles that a mom-and-pop video store would have picked up. Uh, you know, and they picked up a lot of these kind of titles like we're going to talk about tonight. Um, Equal Impact was one of them. I believe that, well, it would have been on my deleted channel now, but uh, Equal Impact with Bob Zadar's in that. Uh, it, it had karate twin guys in it, not the McNamara's that did uh, whatever those Canadian films were that I can't think of off the top of my head. Uh, Double Dragon Encounter or Double Dragon something or whatever. You know what I'm talking about. Um, not those guys, but other karate twin guys or whatever are in equal impact and Bob Zadar is in it. Uh, that, that's kind of the thing I'm talking about. And I'm saying that, uh, uh, you know, for example, in, in Erie, Pennsylvania, where I lived, we had a three-story, uh, you know, three levels uh, uh, VHS uh, movie rental place, right? But it was all VHS back then. So thousands and thousands. It was called the Movie Stop. In, in, in Erie, PA, it's the thing of legend. I mean, they had everything. If, if, if you wanted the, the popular title of the day, sure, they had that, but Blockbuster, Blockbuster might have like you know, eight shelves of it or something like that. <laughs> this kind of place would have like six or seven copies, you know what I mean? But they're going to have equal impact. They're, they're going to have, uh, you, you know, uh, No Retreat, No Surrender 2, you name it. They're going to have all the, the the obscure titles and stuff like that. And and uh, the title we'll talk about tonight, I think, is worth your time. Uh, and we're going to get into it uh, in just a second here. As always, I am joined by the one and only Joe Formosa in Late Night, who is going to join us for it right now. 
As promised, the man that joins me as always for these these uh, uh, forgotten movie dead episodes, if you will, and this truly is one of those <laughs> moments of a forgotten movie. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, to lead into this, just buried in a mom and pop store somewhere on a shelf somewhere because you would have never really saw this at, at Blockbuster Video or something like that, or Family Home Video or any of the popular chains kind of thing. But Joe from Ozone Late Night joins me right now. Joe, how are we doing this evening? I am fantastic. We are at the tail end of October, one of my favorite months of the year. I'm ready to talk about a film that, oh boy, has so much to talk about, so I am ready to go. I am doing well. You know, I, I had come across this movie perusing Tubi, because I watch a lot of Tubi, because I, I mean, I think I have 10 movies on there now, so I'm also always wondering what's going to pop up next of mine on there when you do 16, 17 movies, whatever it is that I've done. But uh, Blood Mercury apparently is on there like any day now, apparently, so that'll be another one up there. But uh, So yeah, I watch a lot of Tubi. And this is one of those that, that popped up there in the, uh, you know, we recommend this to you. And when this came up, I was like, oh, wow, Tubi, it's like, like now I think you know me. Uh, you know what I mean? So I, ch I started checking this out and, uh, you know, it's got a lead, uh, you know, actors that you don't know, lead actors you don't know, a director uh, nobody really knew at the time. This was only maybe his fourth or fifth really super low budget film. Uh, we're talking about Sergei uh, Rod Rodnunsky, I think it is. Uh, he was like a dancer and a choreographer, but then went in to direct uh, like 40 movies I think uh, you know B cinema movies and stuff but we'll, we'll get to him in a minute but um, I'm talking about uh, none other than, than the film we're going to talk about tonight 1993's Rage of Vengeance boy oh boy Rage, Rage of, of Vengeance. Vengeance aka the worst cops in all of LA because boy oh boy <laughs> this is this is some film this is essentially the the stereotypical cop revenge film where uh, an officer was arresting a member of the Asian mafia and when that drug or that sorry that crime lord gets out of what they say is a prison, but what looks like it's an impound car lot. Again, we'll get to that. <laughs> he decides to go after this cop who has left the force because he simply cannot handle that he has killed an innocent woman. Although we don't really know if she's innocent. She was dating a crime lord. And so the <laughs> two of them end up going head-to-head -head in a very, very strange movie where the cops could not possibly be more positioned to be inept. The, okay. the crime lord's wife uh, is essentially killed in a, I guess it wasn't really a shootout, it was just uh, the hero shooting at him or something like that, and the crime lord's wife is killed near the beginning of the film. Uh, that sets up everything else we talked about. Uh, right, they are pretty much the worst cops in uh, L.A.? Uh, where, where are we in this movie, Joe? Well, the stock footage is definitely of L.A., the, the famous Tower of L.A. that you see in every movie over and over and over again. So I'm just going to assume it's L.A. because otherwise, boy, did they pick the wrong stock footage. It's sure not Boulder, Colorado. I know that. <laughs> so to set this up good, and, and this, is, this is indicative of 1993 because by this point, uh, we have got, uh, and again, we'll, you'll follow me on this, people. Well, we already have the naked kata in Die Hard 2 that's done by, uh, I believe, uh, William Sadler, I think, is the, the, the actor that did the naked kata, the villain in uh, Die Hard 2. Anyways. We've also had the I've Got the Power uh, Kata done by the none other than Jeff Speakman at the beginning of uh, uh, what is the movie uh, with Jeff Speakman? The Perfect Weapon, uh, where he does the I Got the Power Kata after he does his construction work and the credits roll at the beginning of the movie and stuff. But in this movie, Joe, we've got another beginning Kata sequence with our star. Uh, uh, he's got two first names, I think. But in anyways, whoever the star of this movie was, he does his kata at the beginning of the film. But as he's doing it, he's seeing uh, hallucinations of this crime lord that, uh, you know, is their, you know, mortal enemies kind of thing. Um, and it's really uncomfortably weird at times, the faces that the crime lord is making at him. And then the, the editing is so bad in this movie, uh, you know, it just kind of hangs on these uncomfortably weird shots and stuff as he's air fighting uh, his hallucinations here, Joe. Yes, the actor's name is Peter Shane. Astonishingly, this is not the director also starring because it should be that way. But, but yes, we have a very long, protracted, as you said, the editing. The editing and the sound design of this movie are unbelievable until yeah. you actually see them. I, it's really probably the, the standout star of the film is the editing. But yes, we get this very strange, lots of close-ups of someone who looks like he's constipated and has had a bowel <laughs> movement for about a week. Then we have the Asian crime lord who 
seems to sincerely love his wife. It's it's a weird beginning to a movie because honestly, I kind of sympathize with the crime lord for a while until until he you know shoots a little girl. But yeah, strange beginning of a movie. Yeah, up until that point later in the film when he when he kills a child. I mean, up to that point though. We look at it like you said. I mean, the hero, how does he miss? He's a cop. How does he miss a guy three and a half feet away from him and shoot his wife instead? But anyways, uh, yeah, there's no blood. There's no uh, squib hits or anything like that, which kind of tells me in this kind of production, um, you know, they probably didn't. In 1993, you still had to have a pyrotechnic uh, pyrotechnician license to do uh, actual like squib hits and stuff like that. They were actually essentially charged uh, almost like fireworks kind of thing back back in those days. So they probably didn't have money for that. Uh, so there goes that. But there's not even blood on T-shirts or makeup or bullet ho holes or anything like that going on. There's just no blood. And then the the partner Peter Shane or Shane Peter whatever whatever his name is, um, you know his I think it's his brother right and the, his wife the brother and the brother's wife gets shot in a car uh, during like kind of an assassination on them. Uh, this is all done right at the beginning of the movie. There is no blood. You see a gun firing, but of course there's no glass flying and car parts flying and blood and guts flying. There's none of that. <laughs> so uh, it's a really unusual be to beginning of the movie because Joe, you're right. Uh, and you said this, and I want to highlight that. Uh, you said this feels as if Shane Peter, Peter Shane, uh, would be the writer and director and stuff of this movie. It has that kind of feel to it. Uh, but where it doesn't, though, and we'll get back to this, is he his character disappears for like long stretches, especially uh, near the middle to middle final act. Uh, his kind of lead character disappears for a minute or two there. So you know this isn't a Neil Breen type situation because he would never disappear <laughs> for even 10 seconds off screen. So, but yeah. We have all that kind of stuff. It's a bloodless beginning, but there's tons of death. <laughs> there's like four or five characters dying uh, at the beginning of the movie. Uh, yeah, and it really sets up... When I first selected this, Joe, and started watching it, right off the bat I got a feeling of, this is an old uh, 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 Pryor's brother, uh, the, the, the one that died, not Ted, because he's alive. David A. Pryor uh, from Alabama there with, with AIP Action uh, yeah, David, uh, out of Action International Pictures. This feels like it could have been an AIP film until you hit those death scenes that have no squibs because AIP was blowing squibs up all over the place <laughs> in shootouts in their films. So, But it has the feeling of that kind of picture. It almost feels maybe even like an early like David Heavener picture because uh, those weren't really great either, people. Uh, but uh, impressions of it, Joe. Well, in general, as you said, the, the squibs and the blood are missing, so the, the gun work is not fantastic. There are obviously very talented martial artists. Now, yeah. again, I don't think they're, they're highlighted as well as they should be. There's some really, again, weird editing and some, I think, poor choreography choices, not in terms of the actual action. The, the performers are fine, right. but the way it's shot. I so agree. They, there's at one point in the end, the camera's just being shaken. Clearly, somebody's just shaking the camera, so... This movie really fails in not the performers, although there there's some high quality acting around <laughs> it, but it's really in the way that it's shot. The movie is let down. It could be perfectly passable if it was directed and shot better, and if the editing and sound design were, were better. Some of the sound effects are just really bizarre and yeah. badly placed. So it's it's not that I think. Look, it's not a it's not a a reinvention of a formula by any means. I think it's perfectly fun. It's just that it's got some weird editing and some yeah. terrible sound choices. Yeah, I do think it's a pretty fun movie. And when we talk about it now, don't get me wrong, people. I, I'm totally recommending to see this movie, especially uh, those, those people that love the mom and pop early days where they would get obscure titles like Equal Impact like those McNamara Brothers titles and things like that. This falls right in line uh, with those kinds of uh, pictures, you know. But, um... So our hero cannot be a police officer anymore. At the beginning of the movie, his family or some of his family is killed, we mentioned, uh, in a bloodless shootout. He decides in, a, in a, a really a segue that really is just, I believe, uh, stock footage of the city. But next thing we know, he's working at a very small convenience store. And you know what's going to happen next. It is the every action movie out there, especially like a Steven Seagal picture, where you're going to have the hoodlums come in and try to steal 75 cents worth of candy, and they're going to get their asses kicked, Joe. <laughs> Oh yeah, no. This is this is clearly set up, and he says, "I'm not ready to come back because apparently he's still racked with guilt." So yes, he's working at a small convenience store with what appears to be a single mother and a young child. But yes, we have the the <laughs> the 
criminals. I don't know how long these people could have stayed in the criminal business because they are so badly, <laughs> so bad at what they're doing. But what I, what I, that sequence, I hope it was intentionally funny when the guy says, I don't speak English, I don't speak Spanish, but he's speaking in English <laughs> to him, which is hilarious. And of course, we see the cop is able to overpower them with almost no effort whatsoever. And, you know, he may be off the force, but his skills haven't dulled a bit. And, you know, this inevitably will come back with the Asian crime gang later, which it does, and that's what we're being set up for. But it it is, I will tell everybody, one of the things that's delightful about this movie is pay attention to the candy on the counter. <laughs> that I did not know, but now I want to go back and just flip through that part. But but yeah, uh, the dialogue's really, really bad in a movie like this, but that's part of the, that's part of the reason why these movies are fun, uh, you know, especially this convenience store ass-kicking at the beginning of the movie. Uh, the convenience store setting we end up coming back to uh, a couple times, and it feels like everything major that ever gets really introduced, for the most part, happens in the convenience store, whether it's a, other characters or a fight scene or something like that. So all that stuff happens. We, we enter more of his cop uh, friends, uh, I guess. One is clearly, clearly, uh, a, uh, it will remind people immediately of uh, the, the, the African-American police officer in the movie Samurai Cop, because uh, he really screams of that, that vibe. Uh, no spoilers here, people, but yeah, he, he gets blown to pieces in this movie, or he gets shot like five times. Uh, but yeah, we have the Samurai Cop-ish uh, partner there. Uh, you, you know, there's a lot to unpack in this. Uh, you know, you mentioned the fight scenes and some of it. They, we do have good fighters in this movie. Uh, they're not known people or whatever, but they're talented, uh, you know, fighting actors. And I think the one thing you mentioned is the photography. And there's a scene with kind of who's meant to be the bolo yen of this picture uh, is fighting a guy, this small little guy. They're fighting in front of, uh, you know, other Japanese mafia, Yakuza, whatever they are, uh, members there in a uh, dust bowl environment and stuff. But you can't see what's happening because the camera is like off uh, in weird framing where you see their shoulders or something. You don't see the kick that they're doing. And it's, it has to be seen to be believed. But the photography in that scene is really, really bad. But then we get to our lead actor, uh, Shane, you know, Bill Shane, Shane Bill, whatever the two first names he is. Um, you know, uh, his photography seems okay in, in his scenes, Joe. Yeah, I'm not going to say it's universally bad, but you're right. That scene with the, the, the bolo stand-in, uh, which is clearly you're right what it's supposed to be, <laughs> there's a part where he picks up that other performer yeah. who's spinning him, <laughs> yeah. and you can see the camera and the reflecting screen, the light, you can see everything. <laughs> that that, that, that's amazing. Because he didn't edit it out. It's the light. Again, I agree. This movie has to be seen. It's, it is a very charming example of these types of movies. I, I think this was a case where... They had good performers available, yeah. and unfortunately, they just didn't fully utilize them in terms of what we see in the final result. It's not all the time. We do get good scenes, but then you have these other scenes where there's clearly a lot of people fighting. It's just so badly shot that it's you don't really get the full effect of it. So it's very inconsistent. The whole movie is like that. Inconsistent. Inconsistent editing, sound choice, acting at times hilarious, other times good, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's the biggest underline of this. It's worth seeing, but be ready for a rocky ride. Well, well this is, speaking of inconsistencies, and I'm glad you said that, because this is probably my, my favorite uh, big inconsistency moment in the movie, or strange writing segue choices from scene to scene to scene. This might be one of my favorites. Uh, yeah. Anyways, we mentioned we know the little girl is going to die that he makes friends with in, in his convenience store. So there is a scene. She gets shot. He's hallucinating things. Uh, you know, her laying there bloody and dead uh, with her mom, I assume, is like screaming over top of her and stuff. So uh, it, it, we go to a flashback of him thinking about it and stuff like that. But what is the very next scene? It's a sex scene between him and this other character. So we segue from child getting shot, murdered, and dying in the streets of L.A. to, well, this guy's getting some sympathy now and he, he's going to have a sex scene with this lady. Yeah, it, it's, it is a strange set of <laughs> scenes to have back to back because, you know, you're going, you're, this would essentially, you would think, re traumatize this character. Right. <laughs> and so what you would expect is, I, I, I guess there's a way you could do that where he would go to the ex, well, not ex wife, she's still his wife, according to him. Right, they haven't been together in five years. Right. Again, we'll just skip right over that. But this movie does not have the finesse. 
to handle that correctly. Right. And so it's almost just you go from, up oh, girl, bleeding on the sidewalk, screaming to, you know what, let's have a seven minute long sex scene where, you know, it's, it's something out of Showtime's late night movie. Oh, yeah. Right after we just saw a young girl get shot and possibly be dead. So it's... It's again a case of very strange editing. Let's let's chalk it up to that. Maybe this was done better and the edit chopped it up. I don't know. Yeah, well, we move into the final act of this movie now, and you know we have a, a like a lot of these films have. We're in a giant warehouse setting, but they seem to be on some kind of uh, whatever they are on a dig or an oil uh, refinery type set or something like that. Is it's a ginormous dust bowl set like you would have saw, you know, at the end of Dirty Harry, although I think that was a cold thing. You know what I'm talking about. So lots of aerial shots. That's almost their cutaway. Is If we don't have a cutaway shot, we're going to do the aerial shot of this, this base uh, uh, that we're at there. And, you know, the big warehouse stuff, they have cool sets in this movie, uh, you know, for those kinds of pieces. In this last act, they're, they're going for it. There's lots of guns and things like that going off. There's lots of fight scenes cut in with, with the guns. I mean, with better editing, I could see that ending being a mile a minute, which is non-stop fighting, switching to guns. It, it, it's basically uh, bad guys versus bad guys, and our hero is kind of caught in the middle with his wife, ex-wife uh, person there. And, you know, I, I was impressed with it. Then the, the, the AIP... Uh, David Pryor type feel for this movie really came back to me uh, in the final act of this movie where it's the big warehouse fight scene shootout kind of thing, Joe. Yeah, I agree that that scene, that location, that setting was really good. You're yeah. right, they constantly, they clearly had the same, they had a long piece of stock footage of L.A. and they had a long piece of stock footage of an overhead of some industrial area. But yeah, the, the end warehouse, if better edited and you know, staged a little bit better. It is good as it is. Yeah. I mean, you can tell, again, that they obviously had access to some good props. Yeah. They had access to people who could do action sequences. Uh, but it's let down, as we said, with the editing and the inconsistency in the quality of it. So, and, and you do see that they clearly had uh, the convenience store also as location. But if you watch those scenes and you pay attention... You will notice that they're very careful. Nobody gets thrown into a rack of anything. Nothing gets knocked over. <laughs> All the action is in the center where nothing can get broken, which is, again, that's the charm of a movie like this, is that you can clearly tell that whoever they, they got this space from said, don't break anything, and they made sure they broke nothing. And so in the warehouse, whether that was a found location that was abandoned or not, obviously you have a little bit more latitude with that. So people are getting thrown around. You know, you're seeing a lot more running. You have a lot more space to work in because they have all this space to work with and the performers can really do whatever they want. Whereas right. in the convenience store, again, they had to be very careful. Don't break any glass. Don't bump into anything. <laughs> just be careful. So the fight scenes are very limited. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I agree. The end sequence does feel like a prior film or something else where you can feel that that's where the movie really picks up which yeah, is yeah. good because it's at the end yeah I agree with that a, a thousand percent that's where that David Pryor feel to the movie comes back the AIP type cinema stuff which I love AIP cinema I love David Pryor's uh, Alabama stuff down there from Future Force Future Zone uh, all the stuff with his brother all that stuff I love I love uh, you know AIP films from whatever it was uh, even Ron Marchini Adam West uh, uh, did Jungle Wolf 2 and stuff like that there's so many I love uh, uh, from AIP in that time period but yeah the, the endings they go for it they go big but as I mentioned this is the kind of point to in the ending in the last act where our hero kind of does uh, disappear for a moment or two. Uh, there are some really good things that start the final act in my opinion. We have a almost like a Texas bull rope uh, kind of match, except it's with a, a handcuff and chains, as we have like a Michael Jackson-ish fight uh, between our villain and hero as they're chained with handcuffs uh, together and knife fighting and stuff. That's really cool. It's not particularly well shot like some of the other scenes, but, you know, we can live with that for a cool idea. So there's some really awesome stuff like that in there. I thought that was really cool. Uh, but then our hero disappears <laughs> as it's bad guys versus bad guys and then the hero disappears for a bit that would never happen in a neil breen movie or a movie where we have uh, you know our lead actor is also the writer producer star that kind of stuff been there so you know yeah they don't, he disappears for a little stretch there then we come back and then i think again editing joe and I, this time I'm going to say it's a positive thing although it's really bad editing is we get out of the warehouse our heroes escape then he goes back to talk to, kind of make peace with, friends with, one of the, the crime bosses, who then, the bad guy, the main bad guy who he killed his wife, shoots the crime boss, and then we cut to a warehouse with a final showdown of those guys, Joe. What happened there? 
Yeah, that that is <laughs> what one went of the strangest that this should have played out was that that warehouse we should never have left. It should have right. been down to the final right. showdown between the crime lord and yes. the cop, the ex cop, whatever right. he is. That's how you play these things. To then leave and then come back is bizarre. <laughs> and the other thing is, you talked about the, the part where they were chained together with the handcuffs. Yeah, yeah. What the if it's me, I then have when the other gang shows up, the two of those guys have to work together. Then they break the chain and they go back and there's your final showdown. So oh, again, I love it's it. It's like a temporary thing where there's a, a, a not necessarily a truce, but they have to work together. But yeah, it's so. And by the way, speaking of continuity, keep an eye on the wife's pants in that whole <laughs> final sequence because they will be missing the knees. The knees will come back. The knees will go away within the same scene constantly. So clearly they shot this over the course of several days and several pairs of jeans. I, 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 Joe, that's a, an absolutely amazing idea you had, and you couldn't be more right on this. I agree a zillion percent. If we should have never left the warehouse location at the end of the movie. All the crime bosses show up. You know, those guys are main villain who Shane killed his wife at. They have to join forces just to survive the onslaught of other villains coming at them. Then when it's all done, they have unfinished business together, and then they go at it, and then we have our end of the movie, Joe. Yeah, it just... Oh, that would have been awesome. It seems like that's the way it should have gone. Oh, that would have been awesome. anybody would have seen that. If you didn't know that we weren't... If we weren't telling you this and you started watching this movie, I guarantee 99 out of 100 viewers would think that's where this movie's going oh. to end up because of course it would. Yeah. And then when they just leave... It's just this, you, you wonder, is this going to be left on a cliffhanger? Right. Because then I thought maybe that's where it was going, a kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it, final, not a Fight of Fury thing where we're going to have right. a massive cliffhanger if there was supposed to be a sequel. Right. And instead it's just delayed, but it's not like it set up something else, because then I thought, right. well, maybe the crime lord's going to kill the wife. And right. then they'll have the big showdown. Now they'll both, both have lost their wives, and that's the setup. Then you have to have something that happens to justify leaving this big fight, and it doesn't happen. No, it so doesn't So you just happen. sit there and go, why? Did they not have the actors to finish the big scene and they had to reshoot it or something? I don't know. It's the only explanation I can come up with. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, that, that's not out of the realm of possibilities in these kinds of films. I mean, yeah, wow. It, it reminds me, the end of this movie reminded me of like a Bugs Bunny episode where Yosemite Sam is like chasing them all over the place. They get on their boat. Bugs Bunny jumps off and swims to an island. Yosemite Sam swims after him, but forgot that he had a rowboat. So he swims back, gets the rowboat, and goes back to the island. You know what I mean? So it was, that's kind of the ending of what it reminded right. me of. We go back to the warehouse. We were there. Wait a minute. We have this weird scene that I guess is in a restaurant or weird. I mean, it, it could have been shot in a closet for all we know with the crime lord when he shoots him in the head at the end. And then we go back to the warehouse in completely different day outfits. Uh, you know, stuff. I mean, he's wearing a red tank top now. All this kind of stuff's happening. Anyways... Kudos to the villain on his acting. He's got no squibs attached to him. He's being shot 85 times at the end of the movie, just reacting and falling over. They have a blood capsule in his mouth, maybe, but there's no bullet hits or anything happening <laughs> in the film. There wasn't no CGI like that in 1993, that, you know. So, but yeah, that's our big showdown. I think the final stuff of him getting shot by the woman at the end is kind of a little bit of a letdown. Uh, let the guys duke it out and him, you know, uh, you know, end his, his have the hero get his uh, his his due here at the end, but uh, we have one of those endings, fine, okay, uh, but uh, we wasted a lot of really cool locations that we never should have left, especially at the end, Joe. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go more on that and say, no, the ending is a huge letdown, not even a little bit, mm. because as you said, the whole setup of this film is to have these two men duke right. it out. I mean, again, right. this is just what these movies do, and it's what the audience would expect. And the, the way that that ends, and I know you said you thought he had a blood capsule. He actually does it because the way he's moving his mouth, I was sure that that's what was going to happen. He'd have blood coming out because we didn't get squibs. Okay, that's how you get around that. You can have blood coming out and it'll fall down. But he just kind of smiles and falls over. <laughs> and then we get a close-up of the wife, and it goes to slow motion, and then we're at the credits. And we're at the credits, and it was, right. How do you bungle this? This is such a by-the-numbers movie in so many ways, which I'm not even saying is a criticism. I'm just saying that we've seen this before. So maybe the thought was, well, we'll do something unexpected, which, okay, you can do that, but it better be good, and this was not good. This was 
wait a minute, we don't even get a good showdown? We right. got some fighting and then there's no death blow? The wife doesn't <laughs> when she wasn't even shot? I thought, you know, if you had her get wounded, seriously, and then she comes back to shoot him? Okay, motivation, I get it. But, you know, she's in danger. He kidnapped her, but the death blow has to go to the hero. Yeah, yeah I gotta get it then, to him. Yeah, you know, the the director here, as I mentioned, it, it, the Sergei Redundinovsky or, or something like that. You'll correct me, people, on YouTube or Patreon or wherever, but uh, we'll just call him Sergei. Uh, anyways, this was only maybe the fourth or fifth feature film in his career, uh, if that. But I didn't know this watching this movie, Joe, and I never never would have even realized it if I didn't like, like look up his, his movie database credits. He's done, like, directed 40 different features, and it looked like there was a time... After uh, Rage of Vengeance here, as we get into the late 90s, uh, you know, he was working with some, uh, you know, pretty respected actors at one point. Uh, he, does, he did a film called Paper Bullets. Uh, you know, Jeff Wincott is in that. He did a string of better-made uh, B-movies in the early 90s for Republic Pictures, like Martial Outlaw or, or, you know, Mission of Justice, those kinds of movies. Uh, I think it was Armand Asante is in one of his films. I mean, there was a time where I thought, oh, this was this guy's period where, you know, they were going to let him go for it kind of thing. And then once the, that, that 90s, uh, you know, late 90s went away, kind of so did Sergei. Well, as you said, it, 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 the movie is not a trash fire beginning to end. There are definitely sequences that are well done. Yeah. They, they, he clearly knew to get people who were good performers. I, whoever did the fight choreography, you know, they, they did a good job. It's, possible, it's not yeah. like the film is completely incompetent. It's just that there are some strange decisions. And I can't even blame the editing on the director. That might have been a problem with the editor. Who knows? They were obviously able to get access to good locations. Right. The movie is fine, even if it is a carbon copy of other storylines. I don't need it to all be. It doesn't have to be a new original story every time. But you look at that ending, and that I, I'm sorry, the director has to have some responsibility to fix that. That doesn't make any sense. If that was an attempt to do something different, uh, right. it failed. So I'm not surprised that this person went on to do more stuff, because clearly we've seen far, far worse. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> the ending is both the best part of the film and the most confounding part of the film. And that really just kind of makes you scratch your head and go, what happened at the end of this thing? Who made these decisions? It's sort of bizarre. Right. And you, we've got a director, like you said, that was following a, a formula. And then all of a sudden, you know, things you know, were working well and stuff like that. I thought for a, a budget level, you know, this kind of thing, which this is micro budget cinema back then. This is something Leo Fong would have, I mean, Leo would have did a little bit better job, but because uh, he would use squibs and, and have all those resources. But, uh, but yeah, all the formula is there and he's following it. And then something in his mind wanted him to do that. And not only after the wife has the death blow at the end, boom, like you said, it's the credits. The movie's over. So we don't even have time. We're like, what? So, but, uh. I think, you know, th this film definitely I would recommend to all those people that sorely, sorely miss uh, mom and pop video store days where you would go on a Friday or Saturday night not know what the hell you're even looking for and you end up taking home a movie like Rage of Vengeance. Yeah, it's definitely a good time. This is a movie that I would say watch with some people, have oh, yeah. some fun with it, especially it's fun. if you are into action films and you know all the familiar beats you're going to see a lot of it here as you said there's echoes of other movies like samurai cop um and it's also going to be fun to just marvel at the fact that these <laughs> have to be the worst police officers <laughs> in whatever city they're in I mean, we haven't even gotten into the female police officer who <laughs> managed to now look i i've never been a police officer I don't fire guns regularly, so I'm not going to pretend I could hit the side of a barn. But even I know that if you can't tell what you're shooting at, you'd better be sure that you're not shooting at somebody that you know is a hostage. <laughs> and she fires and shoots him multiple times and kills him. This is, I mean, it's just incredible that this person could be a police officer when she kept saying, I won't choke. Well, you know what? I didn't choke. Choking would have been better. You should have hesitated. And instead, this Count Denise Crosby blew away her partner. Right. Unbelievable. Right. Yeah, that's, yeah, we can't make it up, people. Like like Joe said, I I think you'll have a total good time uh, watching Rage of Vengeance. Uh, like I said, you won't know anybody in it. You won't know the director, even though he went on to do a lot of different things. Uh but uh, th this is well worth your time. Have a drink. Watch with some friends. Uh, it's definitely a good one that I, w I would definitely recommend. It has just popped up on Tubi within the last, 
uh, you know, a couple weeks. So uh, you got time uh, to check this one out. But uh, Joe, as we wrap up this episode here, if people want to learn more about Joe from Ozone Late Night, where do they go? They can go to OzoneNightmare.com and you will see two links. One will be for my artwork and one will be for the podcast. And if I can plug something very quickly. Yes. I, for the month of October, did a three-part John Carpenter retrospective with an old friend of mine. And I actually edited video together with clips and audio and all kinds of stuff. So if you love John Carpenter for the month of October, go watch that three-part series because we had a lot of fun doing it. And... Yeah, 10 hours. Set that aside because it does run long. Three parts, 10 hours total. But if you love John Carpenter, you're going to have a great time with that. Everybody loves John Carpenter. But is that on a specific like YouTube channel, Joe? Where do they go for that? And uh, you know what, Lynn? I'll give you the link to the YouTube channel if you want to put it in the notes for yes, the YouTube uh, video, absolutely. And people can click on that and go right there. Wonderful. That would be excellent. So for Joe from Ozone Late Night... I'm writer and director Len Kabosinski wrapping up another edition of A Forgotten Movie Den. Go check out 1993's Rage of Vengeance. We'll see you soon, guys.